Welcome back to Harbour Unbox for yet more Ryzen content. I promise that huge RX 580 vs GTX 1060 showdown is incoming soon. In the meantime, this will have to do a comparison between the Ryzen 5 1400 and 1500X. Both are quad-core parts featuring SMT support for a grand total of eight threads. Two weeks ago, we got our first look at the Ryzen 5 series, but unfortunately at the time I didn't have the 6-core 1600 and 4-core 1400 in hand. Instead, I reviewed the 1600X and 1500X. As it turns out, the $220 US, or $300 Aussie, 6-core 1600 is the golden processor of the Ryzen 5 series. That said, as good as the 1600 is, I was still very pleased with how the quad-core 1500X handled itself. For me, this was pretty great news, and not because the 1500X is particularly great value at $190 US or $275 Aussie, but because it should mean that the cheaper 1400 will be an awesome option for bargain hunters. The 1400 is priced alongside Intel's dual-core 7350K, and although it's only 23% cheaper than the 1600, that $170 US or $245 Aussie asking price makes it much more attainable for most users. There is, however, a possible catch. The 1400 features half as much level 3 cache as the slightly more expensive 1500X. Whereas the 1500X packs a massive 16 megabyte level 3 cache, the 1400 has a more mainstream Core i7-like 8 megabyte level 3 cache. 8 megabytes is still quite a lot though, so what, if any kind of impact, does this have on the 1400? This is the question a good many of you have been asking me over the past week, so here we are, time to find out. At a guess, I would say for gamers, the reduced level 3 cache capacity will have minimal impact. That being the case, I'd recommend gamers save a little by getting the 1400 and overclocking the snot out of it. However, I never like to assume these things, not when a little benchmarking can lead us to the truth. So, in total we have tested 6 games using the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, along with a more realistic configuration using the Radeon RX 480. Though, be aware those results will be mostly GPU bound. Then of course, for comparison, we have the 1400 and 1500X, which have been tested out of the box, as well as a 4 GHz clock for clock configuration, which should be most telling. Finally, the latest display drivers were installed and both CPUs were tested with DDR4 2933 memory. This is the fastest memory speed I can run with these processors for now. Finally, with the exception of Ashes of the Singularity, all games have been tested using DirectX 11 to avoid the performance problems Ryzen faces when using DirectX 12 with an NVIDIA GPU. Starting with Battlefield 1, now if you move to the lower half of the graph, we have the 1500X and 1400 tested using their stock clock speeds with the GTX 1080 Ti. Here, the 1500X was 12% fast when looking at the average frame rate and 16% for the minimum. Of course, the 1500X is clocked up to 13% higher of the box. So how do they compare clock for clock at 4 gigahertz? Well, the margins are much similar. Here the 1500X is just 4% faster for the average, though it is still 7% faster when looking at the minimum. Now with a mid-range graphics card installed in the form of the Radeon RX 480, we see that the margins are completely neutralized. Here the 1500X and 1400 look much the same as they are faced with a GPU limited scenario. This time when testing with Deus Ex Mankind Divider, we see that the 1500X is 16% faster out of the box. Actually, if we look at the 0.1% frame time or the minimum frame rate, it is in fact 22% faster. Overclocking these CPUs to 4 GHz helps to reduce the margin quite considerably. Now the fatter 1500X is just 5% faster for both the average and minimum results. Basically, that means having all that extra cash only led to a mere 5% increase in this title. Once again, we find when using a more mainstream graphics card, the margins close right up, even when comparing the out-of-the-box configurations. Comparing the clock-for-clock -clock performance at 4 GHz, we find virtually no difference between the two CPUs. Hitman is a very CPU-intensive title, and here we see with the GTX 1080 Ti that the 1500X is a good bit faster out of the box, providing 12% more frames on average. Interestingly, this time when overclocked, the 1500X managed to maintain a 7% performance advantage over the 1400. In fact, with the RX 480 handling the rendering work, the 1500X was still able to flex its muscles and provide a little extra performance over the 1400. That said though, when comparing the average frame rate for the clock for clock comparison, the 1500X was just 4% faster. Mafia 3 has some fairly typical results for us. Out of the box, the 1500X was 12% faster than the 1400, while that margin was reduced to 7% when comparing the clock-for-clock 4GHz clock performance. 
The RX 480 results are quite typical, at least once the CPUs are overclocked. Oddly though, at their stock speeds, the 1500X was 19% faster, which is a surprising result with the AMD GPU. That said, once overclocked, the 1400 did match the 1500X. Total War Warhammer is another very CPU intensive video game, and here the 1500X was 16% faster when comparing the stock performance. With both CPUs overclocked though to 4GHz, the 1500X was still 10% faster, which is quite a large margin considering the only difference here is the level 3 cache capacity. However, once we drop in the RX 480, that margin is reduced to nothing, and now we find the same performance from both processors even before any overclocking takes place. Like Warhammer, Ashes of the Singularity is another CPU torture test. Before any overclocking takes place, the 1500X is seen delivering 7% more performance, which actually isn't that much more for this kind of title. Interestingly, even once overclocked, that margin remains much the same. The frame rate has increased for both CPUs, but the 1500X remained 7% faster. As we found multiple times already, running with the RX 480 does once again change the story. The 1500X might be 6% faster out of the box, but once we overclock both CPUs, the margin is again reduced to nothing. Okay, so we clearly saw some differences when comparing the 1400 and 1500X at the same clock speed, which was interesting. That said, this was really only noticeable with an extreme high-end GPU. For the most part, performance looked much the same when tasking the RX 480 with the rendering work. And of course, this is due to the fact that we are mostly GPU bound here. Keeping that in mind, let's focus our attention towards the average figures for the five games tested using the GTX 1080 Ti. And please note, Ashes of the Singularity has been dropped as I didn't measure frame time performance in that title. Here we see that out of the box, without any tweaking, the 1500X was on average 12% faster than the 1400 when looking at the average frame rate. That margin is extended ever so slightly to 14% when looking at the minimum or 0.1% result. Depending on the workload, the 1500X is clocked between 8 and 13% faster than the 1400, so these margins make sense. Removing the clock speed variation by running both processors and all of their cores at 4GHz, we see that on average the 1500X was still 5% faster when comparing the average frame rate and 7% faster if we look at the minimum results. So that extra level 3 cache clearly makes a difference for gaming, albeit not a terribly significant one. Still, when you consider the fact that the 1500X does cost just 12% more, and we saw on average a 7% boost to the minimum frame rate, you have to wonder if it's worth buying the 1400 at all. That said, if you are using a mid-range graphics card such as the RX 480 or now RX 580 or the GTX 1060, then the clock for clock performance is neutralized in almost all the games tested. Also keep in mind that we did stick to mostly testing with CPU intensive games. Therefore, games that are mostly GPU bound, such as Titanfall 2, uh, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare or For Honor, for example, uh, those games will struggle to take advantage of the 1500X's larger cache. So I think you really have to take a step back and work out who would buy the R5 1400 and why. Clearly, this is a processor designed for someone on a tight budget that doesn't want to settle for a dual core Core i3 or a locked Core i5. After all, you do get four cores and eight threads with the 1400, so it's not exactly going to become inadequate anytime soon. Chances are, if you're playing around with what was previously Core i3-7350K money, you're not in the market for a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. Rather, the RX 480 or RX 580 is going to fit the bill a little better. At these price points, saving every dollar really helps, and while having a full 16MB level 3 cache would be nice, if it's not going to net you any more performance with your setup, then what's the point? There's also that vicious cycle of spending. If you're going to spend $20 more to get the full fat quad core, why not spend another $30 to get the 6 core 12 thread 1600? This is the conundrum many consumers are facing at the moment. If you're on a tight budget, I would recommend picking up the 1400 rather than stretching the budget to the 1600. For gamers, if you're going to come up with that extra $50, you're much better off investing that money back into your GPU instead. After all, that's the difference between a GTX 1050 and an RX 570, for example. I can already envision the comment section now. Steve, can you compare the 1400 and 1600 at 4GHz? Damn it, why didn't I do that in this video? I really do need to get onto that massive RX 580 versus GTX 1060 comparison though. 
Finally though, before wrapping things up, I should note that the 1400 comes with the smaller Wraith Stealth Cooler, and this 65 watt model won't support the 4 gigahertz overclock shown in this video. So you will have to spend at least $20 on a basic tower style cooler, though if you plan to push the 1500X to 4 gigahertz or try for 4.1 gigahertz, then an upgraded cooler will probably be in order as well. Well, I hope this video has at least helped you narrow the choice between the 1400 and the 1500X, and possibly even the 1600, even though that model wasn't included. Ultimately though, if you are mindful of the hardware in your system, then it might not actually make sense to overextend on the CPU front. And remember, every dollar you save now can be put towards upgrading to Ryzen 2 <laughs> down the track. And this is probably a more sensible choice for budget gamers, because a six core or eight core CPU will probably be more beneficial in a year or so's time. And that's all for this one. Time to wrap things up. If you liked the video, please hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed already, then I recommend you do so, so you won't miss other videos like this. And speaking of other videos, I'm in the process of setting up the Patreon account for Harbour Unboxed. So if you would like to make a small donation each uh, month, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, as you're probably aware, Google's AdSense isn't paying particularly well these days. Not that it was paying that well previously, but it's even worse now. So yeah, we've turned to Patreon, so hopefully you guys that appreciate the content we do can make a small contribution. Again, we would really appreciate that. Anyway, I'm your host Steve, thanks for watching, I'll see you guys again soon.